So we will begin our tour by heading off in this direction. Visiting with Mrs. Lizzie Wright. Hello and welcome everyone. Thanks for coming today. I am Mrs. L. C. Rice, but you better call me Lizzie. I was born in Ohio in 1848, and my name at birth is Elizabeth Chapman. I'm the daughter of Jerry Chapman and his wife, Susan. Susan's over here. Jerry's over there. You can kind of try to figure that out. <laughs> anyway, Jerry Chapman was known as the veteran butcher of Viroqua. I got married when I grew up. I got married to James Edward Slade. Everyone called him Edward. And we ran Pioneer Meat Market for years, living on the second floor of that business. We had one son together, Fred, born January 1st of 1875. Sadly, Ed died in 1883. I continued to run the meat market, which was at 111 South Mead, the site of Parish Music today. Then, I went into the restaurant business at 111 North Main, where Pacifico operates today. A couple years later, I met and married Robert H. Rice of DeSoto. He was a harness maker, a Civil War veteran, and served as sheriff for one year. We had a son. Robert H. Rice, Jr., who was born on May 23rd, 1887, and we called him Skip. We left Robert in DeSoto when Skip was three years old and moved back to Viroqua. Robert was an alcoholic, and I wasn't going to put up with that. I then purchased two small buildings at 201 North Main, and I opened a restaurant, a bakery, and an oyster parlor. There's only an empty lot there today. In 1891, at my business on 117 South Main, I was arraigned for selling beer without a license, and I pleaded guilty. I was fined $50, which was approximately 1590 bucks in today's money. But what can you do? This building has Cooley Roots Movement there now. I owned a building at 107 North Main, which was Riz, Rizdil Saloon, Saloon, sorry but it was destroyed by fire in May of 1895. I then pitched a tent next to it to use for living quarters and business purposes. This site is where People's State Bank is today. It was rather unusual for women to own their own businesses and work their own businesses. I had my own building 111 North Main, named the Rice Building, where I opened my restaurant and boarding house on December 11, 1895. I had an ice cream, ice cream parlor on the second floor. I furnished suppers for balls or parties. I could accommodate 
75 couples. I also sold baked, sold baked goods. Phew, those were busy years. The basement had a barber shop and billiard hall. My ice cream, which was considered best ever eaten, was my pride and joy. I would not give out the recipe for my ice cream, nor for my specialty cakes, such as caramel layer and chocolate layer cake, though people begged me. I was considered quite the gossip. <laughs> And the local newspaper staff frequented my establishment just to get the latest news. I was very happy to hold court. In the early 1900s, the average life expectancy for adults was only 47 years old. One reason it was so low was children, infants, and mothers giving birth had a high death rate back then, not like today, and that brought the average down. Mm. I closed my business in 1905 and died in 1907 after a long, painful illness. I was 59 years old. I died at home on the second floor of the Bryce Building, 111 North Main, People State Bank is there. You could find the cornerstone for my building at the old St. Mary's Church on West Broadway. It reads, Mrs. L.C. Rice, 1895. Thank you for coming. Thank you for your kind attention. Visiting Mr. Harry Levin. Hello, or Privet, as we used to say back in home country of Russia. I, of course, am Harry Levin. We're standing at the gravesite of my brother-in-law, Winston Moore. He was married to my younger sister, Sarah. I also had an older sister named Hilda. She was married to my other brother-in-law, Sam Gross. We all grew up in part, we're all born in parts of the old country, either in Kapuje, Poland, or in Russia, which is now part of present-day Belarus. We all immigrated to the United States in the early parts of the 20th century. All of us lived and worked in Viroqua in a variety of businesses. My brother-in-law, Winston, is buried here, as you can see, whereas me, my two sisters, and my other brother-in-law, Sam, are all buried in Anchi Cheshed Cemetery, which is the Jewish cemetery in La Crosse. Yes, of course, we were Jews living and working in a small town out in the Midwest. You may all be familiar with the Jewish Felix family of Iroquois. The Jewish Felixes moved to Viroqua from Milwaukee in 1905 and established a clothing store on Main Street, which operated for over 100 years. The Felixes' neon sign still hangs above their former store, which is now Utopia. I've been told that my sister Hilda was walking on Main Street in Viroqua when she ran into a member of the Felixes, whom she had known in her hometown in Russia. Unbeknownst to each other, the two women had immigrated from the same place in Russia to the same small place here in the United States. It goes to show that then, as now, the world can sometimes be a very small place. Speaking of my older sister Hilda, after coming from the old country, she lived in La Crosse with other Jewish girls. She met and married her husband Sam Gross through a marriage broker in 1909. Hilda was very civic-minded. She was an active member of the Grey Ladies 
the American Legion Auxiliary, the VFW Auxiliary, the Women's Relief Corps, the Dorcas Guild, the Rebecca's, and the Pythion Sisters. Hilda received the Julius Rosenwald Citation for Near East Relief during World War I, and received a Presidential Citation for her many World War II contributions. She died in 1958 in Richland Center, where she lived with her daughter. My brother-in-law Sam was a musician in the Russian Army and served in the Russo-Japanese War before deserting. As I previously stated, he married my sister Hilda in 1909, and they moved to Viroqua here in 1912. Sam and I, we were junk dealers who also bought and sold hides and furs. In the 1920s, Sam and I went into business together as Gross and Levin Brothers of Viroqua, dealers in good used cars and accessories. Our business was located at 203 North Main Street in 1934. We dissolved our partnership, and Sam and Hilda went into business, into the furniture business, as Gross's dry goods and furniture store. It became Gross Furniture Store, or house, in 1940, and was located at 112 North Main Street. Sam died in 1945, and Hilda and their son Harold continued the business until 1952. My sister Sarah lived for a time with Sam and Hilda. She was a soldier in a tobacco plant. He, in 1930, she married Winston Moore right here, who was a deputy county clerk. Sarah became the owner of Moore's Consignment Company, located on West Decker Street in 1934. In 1940, she began running Moore Furniture Store at 115 East Court Street. She also continued to work at the Wisconsin Tobacco Plant. Sarah died in 1969, and Winston followed in 1972. After Sam and I dissolved our partnership, I stayed in the automobile business as a dealer in both good and used cars. I continued to sell cars at 214 West Decker Street until 1955. After that, I sold tires as just the Harry Levin Tire Company. I departed this earthly life in 1969. My family and I we came to this small town from a very distant and very different place. A place filled with Cossacks and pogroms and all the evil that existed over there. In this country, we were allowed to prosper and to exercise our own religion. We were allowed to close our businesses on account of the Jewish holidays when our faith dictated that we should. I am truly proud of my family's contributions to the wonderful tapestry of Viroqua throughout the years. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Levin. Now we will head in this direction. Mr. Mullen! <laughs> Mr. Mullen! Mr. Mullen! Mr. Charles Mullen! Mr. Charles Mullen! Excuse me. Uh, do you know Mr. Charles Mullen? I'm here to deliver his three shirts and two pants from the laundry. Nope, I'm afraid I don't. Oh. Well, maybe I can wait here with you, okay? Yep. Uh, yes, what do you want? Oh, oh! You said, yep. I thought you were talking to me. Yep is my name. Yep Fook Loy. I run the Chinese laundry here in Viroqua. Very nice to meet you, Mr. Loy. Who? <laughs> oh, no. It's actually Mr. Yep. Uh, my father was Yep Mon On, and I am Yep Fuk Loi, because in Chinese names, the family comes first. Uh, you might not have noticed, I am Chinese. Oh, my father, Yep Mon On, he was born in San Francisco, but he went back to China to find a wife, so I was born in China in 1890. And then, the same year I was born, my father returned to America, but like most Chinese men who come to America, he left his wife and children behind. 
because even if there was enough money to bring the whole family, the Chinese exclusion laws made it difficult to emigrate from China. I was only able to come on my own because my father was native born here. So I came in, uh, let me see. I was 18 years old when I came. I was born in 1890, so it must have been 1908. Yes, that's right. I arrived in San Francisco, August 1908. Pretty soon I came to Viroqua to help my relatives run the Chinese laundry here. It's kind of a family business. Different relatives of mine have owned the Chinese laundry, one after the other. And other relatives like me, well, mostly relatives, we help run the place. Let's see. First was Yep Sing Ki. He started the laundry in 1895, 96. Then was Yep Kum Poi, Yep Young, Yep Lee, uh, Lu Him. When I got here in 1908, Yep Xian was the owner. There are others that I can't remember right now, but all of us lived and slept and made our home there in the laundry where we all worked, right here in Viroqua. Well, I worked hard, and by 1914, I was the next owner of the Viroqua Chinese Laundry. Me, running my own successful business. Good work. Guaranteed. That, that is what I promised in my advertisement. Good work guaranteed. Uh, here, look at my good work. See how clean these shirts are. I know Mr. Mullen is always very pleased with my good work. Where is Mr. Mullen anyways? He owes me a dollar forty-five cents for three shirts and two pants. Besides, today is Sunday and I want my chicken dinner. See, every Saturday, I buy a chicken from the grocery store that Mr. Mullen works at with his father. And I cook it on Sunday because laundry is hard work and I don't have time during the week. So, I want to go home and cook my chicken from the Mullen grocery store. It's very convenient that Mullen's grocery is just around the corner from my laundry. Or... It was just around the corner until I bought my own building. Did you know I have my own building? At first, the Viroqua Chinese Laundry was on East Court Street, underneath the First National Bank building. But then, in February of 1917, there was a fire at the Anderson Meat Market. The inside was destroyed, but the brick walls and the tin roof were still strong. So, they rebuilt the building, and in May of 1917, I bought that building at 207 North Main Street, and I moved the laundry there. I think I am the first Chinese who ever owned real estate in Vernon County. Not bad for my little Chinese laundry. Now, what Chinese laundry do you go to? You don't go to any Chinese laundry. Oh, that's no good. <laughs> Many Chinese depend on these businesses. You see, back when a lot of Chinese started coming to this country, uh, around the gold rush days, there were many jobs that Chinese were not allowed to do, but they could open laundries, uh, because laundry is such hard and tedious work that not many people wanted to do it. That is why so many laundries are run by Chinese. But in many places, ever since about 1900, or even before, the big industrial power laundries have been trying to put the small Chinese laundries out of business. So, I hope you will support small businesses like mine, because we need all the help we can get. My laundry sure needed help when I went into the army during the Great War. Did you know that I went into the army? 
I was drafted on April 2nd, 1918, so I had to find another Chinese laundryman to look after my business while I was away. But I was happy to go and eager to serve. The army sent me south. No, the army sent me west to Oregon first, and then south to Fort Eustis in Virginia, where I served in the Coast Artillery Corps, helping to defend our nation's coasts and harbors. To thank me, the Viroqua Congregational Church, where I am a member, they included me on their service flag that honors all church members who served in the war. I also got paid for my service, too. After I was discharged on December 27th of 1918, I even got a service recognition bonus of $88.67. That buys a lot of chickens. That reminds me, where in the world is Mr. Mullen? Are you sure you don't know where he is? Well, I... I believe I've seen someone by that name over there. Over there? What does that say? Charles Mullen died 1946. Mr. Mullen died? But he owes me a dollar forty-five for the three shirts and two pants. Would you like to buy three shirts and two pants? Give you a very good price. How can Mr. Mullen be dead? I don't remember, unless... Ah, that's right. I forgot that I also died. <laughs> and I haven't even been in Viroqua for a long time. After the war, I came back to Viroqua, but only for a few months. By 1920, I was living in Minneapolis, uh, again, running my own laundry. Like my father before me, I went back to China to find a wife because there are not many Chinese women for you uh, to marry here. I made several trips and my wife and I had some children, but like my father before me, I left them behind so that I could come to America and earn money to support my family. In the 1930s and 40s, I had my own laundry in Denver, Colorado, but then I went back to Minneapolis, where I died in, uh, let me see. I died when I was 60 years old. I was born in 1890, so it must have been 1950. Yes, that's right. I died on November 2nd of 1950 in Minneapolis. And then as a veteran of World War I, I had the honor to be buried in the National Cemetery at Fort Snelling. As for my laundry here in Viroqua, I ran it for the few months that I was here after the war. And then when I went to Minneapolis, I sold it to another relative. He was Chinese, but he went by the American name of Jack Henry. But then, in July of 1920, Jack sold the laundry to a Norwegian immigrant named Peter Mellon, and he left for California. And that was the end of the Chinese laundry in Viroqua. The only thing left is three shirts and two <laughs> pants. So, I better go find Mr. Mullen so that I can give him his laundry and then I can go have my chicken dinner. But it was nice meeting you. Uh, phone me if you need any laundry. Thank you very much, Mr. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Mullen. has been kind enough to visit with us today. I'll turn it over to her. Thank you, Miss. 
Yes, I'm Lillian Proctor, and I thank you for joining me on this glorious day in this glorious shade. <laughs> Barocqua has been the site of many as glorious days over the year, and I had the good fortune of living here for nearly 40 of those years. Although I wasn't born in Viroqua, I am a Wisconsin native. I lived with my family in Ripon and later on in Phillips up in Bryce County. I was born in 1880 to German immigrant parents. And when I met my husband, Harold, I was teaching at school. But by the time we came to Viroqua in the early 1900s, I was prepared to be a homemaker for our little family of two. There were many stately homes, some of which I am pleased to see are still in existence. Several are still being used as what are being called single family homes, and others have rooms for let. One in particular that I'd like to point out to you is at 305 East Jefferson. That was built by my father-in-law and his wife in 1920. It's a grand home and they built it right across the street from where they had lived all their married life up to that time and raised my husband Harold. There was a celebration of their 50th wedding anniversary at that new Jefferson Street home in 1922, where Harold and I received the guests. It is glorious to see that that beautiful home has survived these many years and continues to be a home as it was meant to be. Incidentally, I understand some cowboy doctor and his family resided there for many years. But more seriously, you should know before the passage of the 19th Amendment, women did not have a voice in their own governance. Although we could have shops and were allowed to prosper on our own, we felt second-rated to the male population. The passage of the 19th Amendment, securing women's right to the vote, celebrated its 100th anniversary last year. 1920 was such an exciting year. that opened new doors for women, and I tried one myself in 1924. Because once women were able to vote, that also meant they could enter the political arena. And I was knowledgeable in the issues and had the support of my husband to delve into politics. Harold had an active career as an attorney, one that he augmented with political aspirations. And although his bids for district attorney didn't come to light, we spent a great deal of our time campaigning for the Republican ticket in 1924. The Republican Independent Progressive Platform endorsed Governor John Blaine in his progressive uh, government and Robert M. La Follette for president. This progressive platform also strongly opposed the Ku Klux Klan and other secret political organizations that would seek to deny the right to worship according to the dictates of one's own conscience because of race, nationality, language, or political, religious belief. I became personally involved in politics that year of 1924, it spurred on by recent activity in Vernon County that I found unsettling. The Ku Klux Klan was having a resurgence of visibility in the state and Vernon County, claiming to promote decency and helping to keep people pure. This group was showing a side that they knew people would accept and even admire, never mentioning the darker side that promoted intolerance for the Negro and Catholics and those that didn't believe as they thought they should. They had recruitment meetings, one here at the Vernon County Camp uh, Fairgrounds in the summer of 1924 that drew a crowd of 300. There was a cross burning in the city park that the Vernon County Censor called a beautiful spectacle. So I ran as a first woman candidate for state assembly as an independent candidate against the incumbent A.E. Smith, former mayor of Viroqua. Let it be known that A.E. Smith had an insurance office in the upper floor of Farmer's Bank at the corner of Main Street and Decker, what is now City Hall. This office was used as Ku Klux Klan headquarters for the county. As the independent candidate, I adopted the Republican La Follette Progressive Platform. I also supported prohibition and saw that tougher laws needed to be installed to enforce it. But I was very concerned with the issues of racial and religious prejudice, particularly with the Ku Klux Klan, whose presence in the county was apparent and disturbing. Let there be no doubt that my opponent, A.E. Smith, was a member of this hateful group, which I concluded from comments he made directly to me. The day that my candidacy was announced, October 1st, 1924, was in the paper. That was the same day that the Ku Klux Klan paraded up and down Main Street at 
upwards to 100 people in their robes and hoods paraded up and down Main Street celebrating their recruitment efforts and culminated in the burning of a cross right in the middle of Main Street. As A.E. Smith was the incumbent for the position that I sought, I feel that the final vote tally of 2,563 to 3,981 was quite respectable. Then, as now, people are either very interested in the politics of the time or simply go along with who they know and what they hear the most about without much of an opinion of their own. And although I find that disheartening, but to view it real realistically, not everyone has the time to care about matters outside their own front door. After my run for assembly, I put aside my political aspirations and had several shops on Main Street. And there were a number of shops um, in those days that you would have one or two or three stores on the main floor and several on the, the next floor up. That was quite common. And those shops, we have many, many that came and went over the years as did mine that came and they went. Sadly, I lost my husband in 1932. It was suicide. I wish I could explain why this happened, but there's really so little I know. If only I'd understood better what Harold was going through. Um, back in those days, people weren't as open about their feelings, and we didn't have the therapies and books and all that is available to people nowadays. If we talked about what was happening with him, Maybe we, maybe things wouldn't have ended up like they did. I found him in his office on the second floor of the Eckhart building, what is now Rockweiler's. I know those spaces have all been changed over the years, but I would still feel very odd to tread there again. So, after a year or so, I moved to La Crosse and and had a place of my own, and a couple times I had lived with nieces and nephews. I was able to keep myself, uh, support myself with needlework and crafts that I did and, and construction, constructing children's garments. I died in 1953 at the age of 75 and, and buried here. And uh, I'll point out the stones to you in a moment, but uh, thank you very much for your time letting me speak with you today. My mother-in-law, father-in-law down there. You notice there's no dates on here. And Harold died in 1932, his mother in 1930, and his father in 31. You can only assume that there might have been some kind of relation in Harold's mind. But it was troubling times. Pressure. Thank you. Pastor Mism. Oh! We have guests. Oh, thank you, Miss Miller. Oh, I was just, I was uh, preparing next Sunday's sermon. And uh, I know the Lord will understand, but it being a warm day, I think I'll remove my robe. Ah, uh, that's better. So wonderful for you to drop by. You see, I am Pastor George Newsom. I am a retired pastor, Methodist. That's my stripe. And I delivered the funeral sermon for Mr. Jefferson Kraft, a very important person that few people may not have heard of in our, in our community. You see, Jefferson Kraft his funeral, funeral took place in November of 1894, when, as he would have said, being a pious old gentleman, when he was took home by the Lord. The 
familiar form of Uncle Jefferson is no longer seen in Baroqua. However, he lays here in this field with all who are buried in the hope of the resurrection. And in a twinkling of the eye, they will all be changed at the last trumpet. If you look over here between the stones for the Mills family and the Perm family, you'll notice there's a barren spot there where there is no stone. That is where Jefferson, his wife Lottie, and one of his daughters rest. Jefferson was up to nearly 90 years old when he passed. He had once been a slave for more than 60 years. Jefferson's mother was also born in a slave, but she was born in Africa. She arrived in this country on a slave ship sometime before January 1st of 1808, when the terrible African slave trade was abolished and ended by our government. This is perhaps the greatest indication that Jefferson and his mother were slaves. And it is likely that Jefferson and his loved ones stood on the auction block more than once. Now Jefferson was born in Montgomery Co County in Tennessee. He lived there until the rebellion when he managed to escape and to win his freedom. He would eventually serve in the Grand Union Army. I know that he was not a young man at the time, being born perhaps somewhere between 1810 and 1820. So he's rather perhaps too old to actually be a soldier. So at the beginning of the, the Civil War, or as we sometimes name it as the war between the states, federal laws prevented colored men from serving in the Union military. However, seeing that times were getting tough for the Union, Congress allowed several to join the, the military as early as June 1862. However, that all changed when President Abraham Lincoln delivered his Emancipation Proclamation. You see, that order freed the slaves, as many of you do remember from your history classes. You do, do, you do still attend the history classes in, in schools today, do they? Do they still teach history? That's good, because they say, if we do not learn a history, we make the same mistakes. But anyways, the Union was three years into that terrible, bloody war, and the Emancipation Proclamation stated that all persons held as slaves within the rebellious states are henceforth and forever now free. This order clearly stated that Negroes could serve in the Union military. A few months later, the Bureau of Colored Troops was established in May of 1863. Now, a special schedule for veterans in the 1890 census records Mr. Jeff Jefferson Kraft as a private having served in Company G of the 2nd Wisconsin Cavalry from July 11, 1862 to October 25, 1865, which was the end of his service to our country. It is not clear how Jefferson managed to enlist in the 2nd Wisconsin Cavalry, as that unit fought in engagements in Arkansas, Mississippi, and eventually Tennessee. He may have joined the Union as it passed through his wherever he was living at the time. And he was probably hired to do important work for the soldiers, such as being a cook, a horse handler, possibly a wagon driver. Could it be that July 11th, 1862, was the day of Jefferson's emancipation? Now my tale moves away from that terrible war because I sense that you are growing more curious as to how a former slave and Union soldier from Tennessee would have any connection to our community. Well, before I can relate that to you, I have to tell you about Cheyenne Valley. Has anyone heard of Cheyenne Valley? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
and you know that it is in which county? Vernon, Vernon County, thank you. Good. And it was perhaps the largest community of colored people in Wisconsin at that time. Most of the people were, that moved there, many of them, were not only of African descent, but also, as we would call back then, Indians. So it was a, it was a very diverse and interesting place to live. There are still many residents and descendants of this community who still observe their rich heritage. And there are yearly, re yearly reunions that mark their history as well as their present. The Fugitive Law of 1850, have we heard this? Have we heard of this? I, I'm a pastor by my training, but Miss Miller, uh, do, they, do they still teach about the Civil War in our schools? They do, excellent. Well, then you should know that the, the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 required runaway slaves or suspected slaves to be returned to the southern rebellious states, but on Wisconsin. I am proud to say that our state refused to recognize that law, considering it unconstitutional if not immoral. And so with the help of Quakers and abolitionists, a community of at least 150 colored people settled in Cheyenne Valley, which is near the town of Forest. Back to Jefferson. Census records record many interesting things about his life. Well, although we do not know much about him before his service to our country, the census fills in some of those details afterwards. The 1870 census of Forest Township gives details about a Negro man, age 68, born in Tennessee, who is living with Cecilia, Celia Craft, age 61, Lottie Godfrey, 18, and Lottie's three-year-old daughter. Now, neither Jefferson nor Lottie could read or write. Again, we know this from census records. So we can only speculate on how they learned about Cheyenne Valley. They may have known about Cheyenne Valley through their neighbors, Ed Harris and Thomas Shivers, who were also former slaves. There may have been some form of communication network that guided freed slaves to welcoming communities in the North. Happy day. On March 20. 7th of 1887 or 1873 Jefferson and Lottie married in Viroqua by the Honorable William Purdy County Judge of Vernon County and we are fortunate to know about that official record that uh, blessed date and blessed event because there is still a record in our courthouse to back up my story now I don't know why they get I don't know why they traveled all the way from the town of Forest down here to the county seat, Viroqua, because at that time we didn't have they didn't have the wonderful roads and vehicles that we have today in, our, in your modern society. They probably would have had to have walked, or if they could have, they would have traveled by horse-drawn wagon, but a long distance over dirt roads. Now well, perhaps, perhaps they wanted to be married in the county seat so there would be an official record of their marriage. It is possible that had they been married in the town of Forest, no real official record would have been on file. Does anyone know what a plat map is? Mm -hmm. Who has heard of, for, for I see there are younger people here that may not be familiar with it, a plat book. Too shy, well, maybe you're not accustomed to your pastor asking you questions from the pulpit. But I'll tell you, a plat book tells you the records of where properties have their boundaries and who were in possession of that. So the plat book of 1878 shows that Jefferson Craft owned 40 acres in section 35 of the town of Forest, which would have been near the local post office. By 1880, according to that year's census, Mr. and Mrs. Craft had four children, Florence, 
age 13. Arthantha, age 8. Benjamin, age 5. And Mary, age 3. I also note that from the census that in 1880, perhaps we need to do a math lesson here, Miss Miller, perhaps. Mm -hmm. But listen to this. This is a curious fact. I note from the census that in 1880, Jefferson is said to be 65 years of age and Lottie 25. Curious. Obviously, Jefferson couldn't be age 68 in 1870 and only 65 years later, 65, 10 years later? That's a serious math. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ms. Miller. So, why the confusion of this? Well, the custom was, many times, former slaves did not know their birth date. And so, when the census takers came to collect their information, the former slaves and the census taker would come to an agreement which would probably be a best guess. But one thing stands about the census, despite the mistakes in ages, or the confusion about the age of Mr. Jefferson's age, there were 40 years difference between Jefferson and his wife Lottie. The Kraft family appears on the 1885 state census as still living in the town of Forest, but not thereafter. I cannot recall when the family moved to Roqua, but I do believe it was sometime in the late 1880s. No reason was given for their move. Their previous home of Cheyenne Valley was one of the largest rural colored communities in Wisconsin at that time. Viroqua was quite the opposite. Jefferson may have retired from full-time farming, but still needed an income to feed his young family. The county seat would have been a more productive or more appropriate place for a retired farmer to find employment. No matter the reason, the Kraft family became the first Negro family to take up residence in the city of Viroqua. Now in your modern times, in your modern times, a Negro moving to Viroqua would not be worthy of much, much notice. But that also surprisingly seemed the same with the Kraft family. In fact, the Kraft family is remembered with respect and much admiration. Jefferson was fond of horses. So it was very fitting that he found employment at the dray barn of Francis Marion Minshall that was located north in, on North Main in Viroqua. Now perhaps we have some residents who live on the street that Mr. Minshall is named after. In the 1870s, Frank Minshall, Minshall as he was known by many, drove a team of horses between Viroqua and Sparta to haul freight. Local general stores were supplied with their merchandise by this freight business. Now, can you imagine the big store, Walmart, having all of its goods and merchandise being delivered by a horse-drawn wagon? That would be a lot of wagons. But local stores depended on, on his business to fill their shelves. But when the railroad finally reached Viroqua from Sparta in, in 1879, Minchel switched to running a dray and, and dray and bus line in Viroqua. Now, a dray is kind of delivery wagon, and sometimes people would not always own horses because it would be more convenient if you lived in town to rent a horse and a wagon. But the bus service, well, it's not like the school buses perhaps this young man has ridden in. They were quite different. They were basically wagons with lots of seats so people could be transported from the... Uh, train station to the hotel or wherever their final destination could have been. So eventually, remember Jefferson's son Ben? Eventually he grew up and he went to work in the dray barn with Mr. with Mr. Kraft. Now Mr. Mr. Minchel, Frank as he was known, was very fond of horses, race horses in particular. And he took a trip to Kentucky to purchase Vernon, a horse that was acclaimed to be the fastest, fastest horse in all of this part of the country. Jefferson and Ben 
were entrusted to the care of this horse. And it is said that no horse ever received as good care, never groomed any better. Now to further his income, Jefferson took it, found employment with the city as a lamplighter. In those times, Veropa had no lights, electric lights. Imagine that. And so kerosene lamps on posts serves as the only street lights on a four block section of Main Street. A few other lights lighted the areas near the courthouse and east on Jefferson where the schools are located. Or are they still located on there? Yes, there is still a school there. Uh, now imagine that time when you had to send people out carrying a heavy ladder to light the lamps. It's not like today where you just turn on the light and perhaps all the lights in Baroque will come on. Imagine how that would have amazed people at that time. But Jefferson and his son could be seen in the twilight and in the summer and winter on their daily walks tending to these lamps. Ben was a strapping teenage boy who led the way for his father who was much smaller in stature and walked with a limp. Ben carried the ladder that was needed to reach the lamps on their post. The father, though, would faithfully climb each lamppost and do his job with dignity. He was not given to much talking, but if you greeted him, he would resp respond with a bow and the raising of his hand as though he was saluting. Now, as sad as it is, there is no gravestone in that empty part of our cemetery to mark where Jefferson, Lottie, and their daughter lay sleeping. I pray that someday there will be stones to mark their resting spots. It is a certainty that Viroqua residents of my time had only kindly thoughts of Jefferson Kraft and his family. When the plaintive and beautiful song, The Lamplighter, which was popularized by the late Bing Crosby, came out, it may have brought tears to the eyes of Roquins and perhaps fond memories of our old lamplighter from long ago. Thank you. You'll have to forgive me. I have to go back to my sem my sermon notes for next Sunday. I hope to see you in the church. All right. And you can follow me for some refreshments in the gazebo. Thank you very much. Historical Society. Mm -hmm. 